Hello everybody and welcome back to part two of this deep dive about the history behind Young Living essential oils. In part one, we covered the history behind the founder and how important it is to know exactly who would be at the helm leading this soon to be infamous MLM. And now that we saw who exactly was behind the makings of this company, which is an absolute train wreck of a past, we now will be able to take a better look into today's video and focus on the company itself. And it doesn't get much better I can assure you on that. Now, in part two of this video series, we are shifting away from the owner, Donald Gary Young, and into the company Young Living and what it produces. And there are a couple things I feel as though I should clarify up front to you, the viewer. This video is not an attack on essential oils, nor do I think essential oils are useless. Essential oils are, in my opinion, best used as a room diffuser to make your room smell nice. There are some studies out there and people that suggest that aromatherapy can assist in reducing issues like headaches or help you feel more awake or happy or things like that. And I'm not gonna take that joy away from anyone who wants to feel as though essential oils can have that effect on them. And that's not my message behind this video either. What I am against is a company that manipulates sellers and buyers and pushes false narratives that essential oils can cure diseases or that it's a viable replacement for medicines or even foods, which as a side note, most essential oils are not actually safe for consumption. So if you're using oregano oil in your pasta, please stop. It's not that hard to swing by the fruits and veggies and grab some fresh herbs or even the dried ones. So a quick recap before we dive into part two of this video. In part one, I discuss the interesting history behind the founder of Young Living, Donald Gary Young. I address him by his full name because he has tried multiple times to act like a doctor and was even charged for practicing medicine without a license. If you look on the Young Living website, you can see he's referred to as D. Gary Young in what I think looks like an attempt to look like Dr. Gary Young and to make him appear more qualified than what he actually is. And speaking about those qualifications, his degree is from a pay for degree fake university and having a doctorate from a fake university shouldn't get you far. But hey, this is also the guy who couldn't get his own story straight about when he was even introduced to essential oils and who killed his own newborn daughter, was charged with practicing medicine without a license and claiming to cure cancer. Oh, and he's also the guy who opened a clinic in Mexico that was exposed by the Los Angeles Times for faking statements by showing that they could not even properly identify blood on a slide. This guy, Donald Gary Young. If you haven't watched part one, it's an absolute roller coaster of a ride and will shed a lot more light onto how and why Young Living was started and might even explain some of the erratic behaviors of the Hunbots in the company and the absolutely weird claims they make. And no, the things I just said were not over exaggerations. This guy actually has one hell of a crazy backstory. So let's go ahead and move forward and take a look at the essential oils MLM empire he created. Let's get into it. 1993, Young Living Essential Oils is founded. Well, sometimes. Some parts of the internet say 1992, 1993, or 1994. I guess it depends on what source you wanna go with. So I'm just gonna go with 1993 since it's right in the middle. In 1993, Donald Gary Young and his wife, and at this point he had been going through wives like cheap bottles of wine, so I really haven't bothered to keep track of names, but I can say I'm pretty sure this isn't the one he almost killed though. So that's both good and bad, I suppose, yeah. But hey, controversy in the law are two things Donald Gary Young couldn't seem to escape. He was arrested in September, 1993 for threatening several family members with an ax. Two days before this alleged assault, Donald Gary Young was actually ousted from his position as CEO of Young Living for fraudulent misrepresentation of himself as a doctor, misuse of company funds to support his personal endeavors, erratic behavior during meetings, among other problems. According to police records from Spokane, Washington, two days later on September 29th, 1993, he returned to the company headquarters with an ax. He attempted to force his way into the locked building by removing door hinge pins, battering the doors with an ax, and then threatening to terrorize company employees and even his wife. And he had to be removed from the property by local police. This arrest led to court actions against him in Utah County, Utah. Several members of his family to include his own mother, sister, and niece had all filed sworn affidavits to the courts. And the documents revealed some of the hidden 
nature of how Donald Gary Young acts behind the scenes when he thinks no one is watching, caring, or has a strong enough backbone to go against him. These documents described an extremely abusive home life to include spanking his infant children and kicking them with pointy-toed cowboy boots. His mother wrote that he was mentally and emotionally abusive towards her. And so even with all this early on and even getting ousted in essentially the first year of Young Living Oils, he still manages to come back for some unknown reason as the CEO and continued to try and build this empire. So eventually him and his wife joined forces to buy a 160 acre farm to start growing herbs for their new essential oils company. In 1994, Young Living built what they claimed to be the largest, most technologically advanced essential oil distillery in North America. And from here, they began to grow the brand of Young Living and everything seemed okay in the beginning. And by okay, I mean quiet. But just like Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, Pompeii had no idea that the monster hiding in the mountain was going to explode. But you know, maybe I was wrong about Donald Gary Young and perhaps it was possible to reform and change his ways. Unfortunately, it was his wife, Mary, who would plague the company with their new problem, multi-level marketing. She introduced this business model to the company as a better way to market and sell their oils. She herself was apparently quite a successful MLM hunbot with a company called Sunrider and took that knowledge and incorporated it into Young Living's personal blend. And don't worry, Donald will keep finding a way to make negative headlines for the company because he just can't seem to control himself, honestly. I don't know what other reasons there could be for some of the shenanigans they're going to get themselves into, but you're gonna see this unfold. But in the meantime, the two began cultivating and growing their farms, oils, and distribution networks. And for a few years, everything was moving slowly, but surely. That is until the year 2000. On August 17th, 2000, there was an explosion of a distiller that fatally wounded one of the employees on Young Living's farms in Mona, Utah. That man, Juan Gomez, was the father of four and his life was taken from him and a father was taken from his children because of shoddy craftsmanship on behalf of Donald Gary Young. On December 7th, 2000, Young Living Farms was cited with seven violations from the Utah Occupational Safety and Health Division as a direct result of this explosion and were fined. Here are the seven violations that were assessed to Young Living. Management did not take appropriate actions to correct unsafe conditions and practices pertaining to operation of distillation vessels. No consideration was given in the design and construction of distillation vessels with respect to American Society of Mechanical Engineers requirements pertaining to design and construction of pressure vessels. Respirators, which are necessary to protect the health of the employee were not available and there was no respiratory protection program and proper evaluations were not given to ensure the health and safety of the employees working in those conditions. No formal written permit space was implemented for employees who routinely entered into the permit required confined spaces, specifically the distillation vessels. Employer did not establish a program consisting of energy control procedures, employee training, and periodic inspections to ensure that before any employee performs any servicing or maintenance on a machine or equipment. Pulley belts were left unguarded and left employees exposed to nip points. Oxygen cutting using either a chemical flux or iron powder or gas shielded arc cutting of stainless steel shall be done using mechanical ventilation adequate enough to remove the fumes generated. What really upsets me about this is that on their website to this current day, they seem so proud of how they claim to have built the most technologically advanced essential oil distillery. And yet when you look at the violations I just listed, it really shows that they were sloppy and cheap with their design and had a lack of care for their employees and their safety. And that employee's death was unnecessary. And quite frankly, it looked like they did their best to sweep it under the rug. Also in October, 2000, Donald Gary Young opened the very ambitious Young Life Research Clinic Institute of Natural Medicine in Springville, Utah. Because you know, the first first attempt to have a medical clinic with an unlicensed practitioner worked so well. It's just so strange how he just can't seem to get away from the idea of being a doctor and yet had literal decades to study and get a legitimate doctorate, but he chose to try and take the easy way out and essentially trick people into thinking he's a medical professional when he is not. He bought his fake degree in 1985. And so in the year 2000, he would have had at least 15 years to get a degree from that point, but he still chose not to do that. However, it does appear that in those 15 years, he had gained some kind of knowledge or maybe it 
was just a fear of being charged for practicing without a license again. I say this because when he opened the doors to the Young Life Research Clinic Institute of Natural Medicine, he actually hired a licensed doctor this time around. However, he hired someone named Sherman Johnson, MD. Now, I've said it a couple times already, but who could, in good faith, actually work for this kind of individual? Well, apparently this doctor could. And well, after digging into some of his background, it became perfectly clear why. Back in this man's past, it appears he actually has a manslaughter charge against him. And what happened, you might ask? Well, it appears as though Sherman's manslaughter charge is in connection to the death of his girlfriend. He incorrectly injected his longtime girlfriend and purposefully overdosed her with narcotics. He then falsified her death certificate to hide his crime. And for a short while, he got away with it. That is until a nurse came forward and believed there was something weird or suspicious about the nature of the girlfriend's death and brought forth corroborating evidence of wrongdoing and her body was actually exhumed. Once tests were redone on her body, he was caught and only managed to avoid a homicide trial by pleading guilty to manslaughter instead. And this is who Donald Gary Young hired as his doctor for his foundation. And this clinic is now off and running. And it was set up in a very similar way to the clinics in Washington and the one he had in Mexico. The clinic operated on a cash basis only and guests would pay a $349 fee to register and then were offered long form treatment plans to cure their various ailments. These treatment plans ranged from 2,000 to $3,000 and almost every single product sold to treat the patient's various ailments were blends of essential oils and supplements sold only by Young Living Essential Oils. Patients had to additionally sign a form stating that they were not a member of the press or any regulatory agency. So I guess they really did not like the little expose the Los Angeles Times pulled on them back in the 80s. It should also be noted that during this timeframe is when Donald Gary Young invented something called raindrop therapy, and it's every bit as kooky as it sounds, and it's something they actually still talk about and promote on their website today. The raindrop technique is a young living signature. Our members around the world study this technique developed by Young Living founder D. Gary Young for its unique way of harmonizing, rejuvenating, relaxing, and aligning the body and mind. Whether you're experienced in raindrop or you're just beginning to explore, Join us for this simple step-by-step guide and discover for yourself this unique approach to mind-body wellness that emphasizes essential oils and accessing energy. It is a technique, although I use that word very, very loosely, of using seven single essential oils and two blends formulated by Young Living Essential Oils. The concentrations of all these doses combined are too high to be considered safe and are known to cause skin irritation, sensitization, phototoxicity, toxicity and essential oil toxicity. Donald Gary Young peddled this unsafe treatment as a very effective way to cure a variety of medical conditions and even said it was effective in veterinarian applications, especially for horses. There are however, no actual proven tests that can accurately conclude that this actually helps anyone or any animal. Something oddly disturbing about this raindrop technique is that even though it has no proven benefits and has some very serious notable side effects, it is something that is actually still promoted on Young Living's website to this day. So after all the fun Donald Gary Young was having with his latest clinic, a few years had gone by. By 2002, Young Living's website began to list Donald Gary Young with the title ND, which stands for naturopathic doctor. But as we have previously brought up, his supposed degree is not from an accredited college and is not a valid license. In a WordPress article from Adulterated Oils, they claim on April 2nd, 2002, they called Young Living's headquarters and asked if Donald Gary Young was licensed to practice naturopathy in Utah. The representative on the other line said he did, but refused to give his license number, something that would be categorized publicly with the Utah Division of Professional Licensing. This person claimed that after they filed a complaint with the community that Young Living removed the MD title from Donald's name. As a matter of fact, I went onto Young Living's website using the Wayback Machine and I found a June 2005-2002 archive that actually says in the company information, it says, where can I find information 
information about Dr. D. Gary Young, which literally shows that they used to say he was a doctor, even though we all know with empirical proof he was not. And I'm sorry if you're seeing this and it's purple and I'm highlighting words and stuff like this on the screen. It's because it was literally a dark purple background with black text and it is so hard to read, but it literally says, where can I find information about Dr. D. Gary Young? And it says to find information about Dr. Young, click on the about Young Living button on the left-hand side of the homepage or at the top of each subsequent page. A new page will display which talks about Young Living. Now, for the next couple of years, Donald Gary Young and his company were able to remain relatively under the radar until 2004. In 2004, the Utah Attorney General charged the clinic and their employee with practicing medicine without a license for conducting diagnostic tests and prescribing products to patients at the clinic between the years of 2000 to 2002. Additionally, on March 20th of 2004, at the Total Health Expo in Toronto, Canada, Donald Gary Young spoke on the topic of hormones and rejuvenation, which yes, get ready to hear some beyond outrageous claims, because this almost feels like a joke with how obscene the situation was when it happened. Eva Briggs, MD, an actual doctor, was there and wrote one hell of a tale of her recounting of this talk given by Mr. Very Real Doctor Man who didn't pay for a fake degree at all. And here are some charming snippets for you. Young showed a series of photos of old people that he claimed to have personally visited. He inflated their ages beyond the realm of biological plausibility. Young continued to perpetuate the long since debunked myth of Hunza longevity. The claim that the Hunza people commonly live to more than hundred years old is false. Gary Young also showed a photo of a man that he identified as Sheryl and reported that the man's age is 168 years old at the time of the photo taken. The man in the photograph appeared to be Shirali Mislamov. Mislamov was reported to be 168 years old by National Geographic magazine. Young stated that he personally interviewed and photographed Mislamov. However, this is not possible. Mislamov died in 1973. Per Young's autobiography, Young was hit on the head by a falling tree in February, 1973 and spent months in the hospital, then paralyzed for several years. At the last portion of the talk, Young went off on a bizarre tangent, claiming that his research showed that young women, teens and 20 year olds employed in his company had postmenopausal hormone levels and the elderly women that he tested all had premenopausal hormone levels. However, Young asserts that his pregnenolone containing products such as prenolone cream can save women from this pitiful fate. So essentially what happened here is that once again, Donald Gary Young just can't seem to keep his story straight. It also appears that he believes that people are gullible and will just forget the things he actually said. For those who get wrapped up in this cult-like environment, you'll be fine with believing everything he says. But for the rest of us who see through this, like Eva Briggs, it was absolutely shocking to hear such clear deception. In 2005, a lawsuit was finally settled between Young Living's clinic and a woman who claimed to have almost died due to improper care given at the facility that led to kidney failure. She claimed before going to the clinic, her kidneys were perfectly fine and functioning, but as she became more involved with the clinic and following their health regimens, in particular vitamin C infusions she was taking, that those infusions had caused her renal failure and almost cost her her life. After this lawsuit was settled, Donald Gary Young closed the clinic without warning and quickly relocated to Ecuador, where there were far less restrictions and laws regarding his medicinal practices and how he was treating new patients there. Now, between the years of 2005 to 2013, Young Living actually managed to stay relatively under the radar, but bigger and worse things were building for the company. In this almost decade time period is when Young Living now begins to grow and finds its footing as a successful MLM and starts making millions of dollars and gaining many, many distributors. However, while they were under the radar, they continued to develop and strengthen their following and their idea of this unique process to the company called Seed to Seal. And I want to expand on this claim for just a moment. One of the things Young Living prides itself on is the idea of how it treats the plants it uses in its oils as a seed to seal standard. In this process, they claim that they source everything for their oils from corporate owned farms, and they control the entire process for creating their oils and oil blends in a way that promotes them as superior. But here's the real tea on this wording. It means absolutely nothing. You see, there are no standards for authenticating essential oils in aromatherapy. The registered word mark has not been provided to them by the FDA as a claim and is meaningless in proving their oils are actually of any certifiable grade at all. What this really means is that because they are up to the standard of seed to seal and all of the identifying of how pure their oils are done is all in house,
house by people who live on the Young Living payroll. And these people will make the claim that their oils are of the highest quality of the market. I mean, if you worked for Young Living and your job was to determine how pure or awesome or amazing their oils were, wouldn't you just say that the oils were the highest grade too? I mean, alternatively, why wouldn't you? When you get control of the scale and you get to change it to fit your standards, then everything can be considered the best quality. But one of the most interesting things about the wording of seed to seal is that it does make an implication from the seeds they grow to the time they seal their bottles of oils is a complicated process that they 100% control. The reality of the situation is that their production rates exceed the farm acres they actually have access to. And they tout the message that they control the best process and use the best, freshest, and purest ingredients. When they bring prospective buyers to their farms, it's always to their lavender farms. And why do you think that is? Because it's one of the few ingredients they actually produce on a farm that they actually own. Some very interesting information I came across while I was looking into this was that they do own a select few farms, but the vast majority of their products just cannot be produced on their corporate farmland like they would like you to believe. They claim to have over 600 life-changing products and more than 270 essential oils and blends. And so they had to employ the assistance of what they call partner farms, which in of itself isn't terrible. It's fine to partner with larger farms to help produce crops you can't or won't personally produce. Businesses working with each other is completely normal. It just seems odd to try and appear as though they really don't do this when they do. It is mentioned in Young Living's website, but it's overshadowed by their seed to seal shenanigans. And while I was doing my research and looking into what else could be shady about their supposed seed to seal process, I came across a website called Sweet Willow Spirit Therapies owned by Melissa Clymer, an actual naturopath. She had written an article describing some more details about why Young Living remains very secretive about their process and why they don't want to disclose the entirety of their essential oils creation process. And here's what she had to say. The fact is they don't grow all or even most of their plants. Many of the oils they offer grow in random corners of the world where they own no land or distilleries. As one example, they harvest balsam fir from Northern Idaho, but they did not plant the trees or carefully select the soil they were planted in. These trees were there long before Young Living was even a company, much less started harvesting them. So this seed to seal guarantee is a false, hollow promise that is impossible for them to fulfill. Only the plants they grow themselves could possibly hold up to this standard. She furthered this example by explaining the use of sandalwood trees in the oils. So I'm not really a botanist or super into the history of trees, but I found out that sandalwood trees are actually the second most expensive tree in the world to harvest. And that in the past, the trees have been endangered due to their very slow growing process. And it takes about 15 years for one tree to mature. And because of this slow growth, they're easily over harvested. Sandalwood is only grown in a few specific areas of the world. And while most are harvested legally, there are a few places where the trees will be harvested illegally because of how valued they are. And this over harvesting causes those specific species of tree to die out. Australia is the largest global exporter of sandalwood trees with 37,000 acres of land dedicated to these trees. And it is a careful and dedicated process to preserve, but also to harvest the trees. Melissa states that everyone who sells sandalwood essential oil obtains it from the few distillers who actually have access to the plants. But this directly stops Young Living from being able to hold themselves to their own standard of seed to seal because they have no control over the process of how these trees are cared for or the quality of the oil produced by the trees. They're just purchasing the distilled oils. So what is my point with this little tangent about their seed to seal process? My point is it's just a marketing tool and a fantastic one at that as it has successfully tricked many, many people into getting involved with a company with whom they believe they're paying more for a more expensive, but more pure oil. And maybe they are, but there's no industry standard to prove the validity one way or another. The purity of essential oil is literally a he said, she said claim. And obviously if you work for Young Living, you'd claim yours are the best. Speaking of oils, let's also talk about mink oil. You might remember this lady from the intro in part one. Having a high quality ingredient shouldn't mean the deaths of a whole bunch of little creatures. You can't say on one hand that you're company is all about like natural God-given oils to help people's health and then turn around and support the needless slaughter and mistreatment of these creatures that God made. And she mentioned the senseless killing of animals. And if that seems a little bit off-putting or even confusing, then you're not alone because I was too. Why would animals even be mentioned in a video about essential oils? Well, it turns out Young Living used to use mink oil in certain creams as a rejuvenating ingredient. Unfortunately for the minks, you don't get mink oil by giving them hugs or collecting it from saliva or sweat. They have to die. And then the oil is extracted from their skin post-mortem. I found it 
weird that a company that is all about this whole seed to seal process would approve of mink oil. Their process claims that our oils are sourced from our corporate owned farms, partner farms, and seed to seal certified suppliers. This empowers us to source conscientiously and with sensitivity to local communities and ecosystems. We vet and select our like-minded suppliers according to five principles, established relationships, seed to seal specifications, binding agreements, stringent testing, and ongoing audits. Not too sure how you vet the process of killing minks for oil in their skin, but okay. And apparently they thought they could, or at least until PETA sunk their claws into them for this. I'm not a huge fan of PETA, and I think as a company overall, PETA's not too great, but this would be one of the few exceptions where they may have done something right. After PETA got a hold of them and started causing a ruckus, their products no longer contained mink oils, but it's so weird that when you do a quick search, you can still see the metadata showing the oil description for a product where they prominently display the use of mink oil in their products. So that's a thing. So now let's jump to 2013, where Young Living once again embarrasses themselves. In 2013, Young Living sued doTERRA, another essential oils MLM. This lead up was pretty much straightforward. Four former executives from Young Living left and created their own company called doTERRA. Now that's a little shady all on its own, but that's not too important. What does matter is that Young Living decided to file a case against them for violating confidentiality contracts and poaching sellers. The lawsuit was dismissed by a judge because they stated Young Living acted in bad faith. So let's take a look at what happened. The four executives left in 2007 and 2008, but the lawsuit wouldn't be filed until five years later. The judge's ruling stated that this was too many years that had passed before Young Living did anything, which made it appear more like this was a lawsuit to try and shut down or significantly hurt doTERRA's growth as a competitor. Additionally, the suit filed claimed there was $350 million in damages, but Young Living had issues proving to the court how exactly they even came up with that number. Now, I don't support doTERRA either as they are another MLM company, but something interesting was brought forward in the deposition phase of this case that hurt Young Living substantially more than if they had just bit their lip and stayed quiet. But you could probably tell already, Young Living has not had the best track record of staying in their own lane. So here's how they messed up. During the information period gathering for the trial, there was a dispute over company secrets being stolen from Young Living. And so a comparison of the oils from the two companies was needed to be compared. Dr. Robert Pappas, PhD, one of the field's leading analytical chemists and the Dean of the widely respected Essential Oils University performed the test between the two companies. What he found was obviously kept as quiet as possible, but let me just blow the lid open on this one. His findings showed that certain samples of Young Living's essential oils contain synthetic compounds. Here's why this is so damning. Young Living claims there are no synthetic oils, compounds, or whatever you wanna call it inside their oils. They claim everything is carefully sourced and 100% natural. It's right here on their website. But these comparison tests showed empirical data that Young Living was lying to their consumers. Dr. Pappas was brought in after his many tests years prior on Young Living's oils. He was originally given a sample of jasmine oil to test and his findings were published and stated that the oil had a very high percentage of a chemical known as DPG, which was being sold as pure jasmine oil when it was not. Young Living had originally contacted him to retract his statement and his study, but the university he worked with on the study kept the study up and claimed that there was no need for retraction if Dr. Pappas knew with certainty that his conclusions were accurate. As a funny side note from this lawsuit, Dr. Pappas was actually previously hired by Young Living before this lawsuit in what he initially thought was the company trying to improve its oil standards. He later discovered the synthetic compounds in the jasmine oil and also that a particular birch oil they used was not authentic. And it was actually something called methyl salicate, which is a generic wintergreen fragrance used in beverages. When they asked him to retract his findings, again, Pappas refused and took his findings to BYU and told Donald Gary Young the following. Bringing me here was a farce. You just basically wanted to use my name to promote your products. You didn't want accurate information. I gave them the report and I said, I'm going home. His findings were used in conjunction with more research tests by an independent lab in France. The second chemical analysis was conducted by this group, otherwise known as the CNRS, and they are a public research body under the supervision of the Ministry of National Education, Higher Education, Research, and Innovation in Paris, France. Here's what they concluded. For each sample, the composition is not in agreement with norm ISO FDIS 856. Abnormal presence of ethyl vanillin, a molecule of synthetic origin. The presence of this synthetic ingredient was found inside peppermint essential oil samples. So not only was this lawsuit dismissed against doTERRA, but it also brought forward the data to show that Young Living was not transparent with their oil 
sale process and not opposed to putting synthetic ingredients in their products while claiming they were not. I also feel like this is a good moment to also discuss their prices and why they claim their oils cost so much, especially in lieu of what has just been presented. So Young Living claims their oils cost more. And when I say more, I mean way more expensive. Why? They claim their ingredients are more pure and to the highest standards, which as we have already seen is something they can't even hold themselves up to. And they're the ones that made their own scales of purity. Their bottle of lavender essential oil right now costs $31.91, while a local competitor's is only $6.99. And how about this one, this one, or even this one? The point I'm trying to make here is they have inflated their prices and created their own scale of purity to use it to justify their high prices. And there are many companies out here creating and selling their own essential oils at a much more affordable price. If you want some oils to use in a diffuser, be my guest. If a certain smell helps you relax after a long day, then smell that oil. But don't support a company that acts like a pyramid scheme and hurts its sellers, overcharges you the buyer for oils that you could buy from a more competitive and reputable source, but one that can't even hold themselves to the standards they set for their own oils. Now, moving on from 2013, in 2014, Young Living was issued a warning statement from the FDA. In the letter dated September 22nd, 2014, the letter said that Young Living was making claims that their products were being promoted by sellers as cures for conditions that would classify the oils as drugs. And then the FDA provided quoted statements that were being made by Young Living's website, its promotional materials, or by its sellers. Let's take a look. Viruses, including Ebola, are no match for Young Living essential oils. Top on my list is Thieves. Thieves is highly antimicrobial. It could help against Ebola. Regular use of rosemary essential oil may help prevent diseases associated with free radicals, including cancer and heart disease. Rosemary research in regards to Alzheimer's disease showed aromatherapy as a potential treatment for cognitive impairments caused by dementia. Rosemary has an antimicrobial and antiseptic qualities that may help eliminate eczema and dermatitis. Myrtle is a wonderful antiseptic. It has been known to protect against tetanus. Peppermint oil has so many more uses, asthma, autism, brain injury, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, paralysis. Lang Lang is used medicinally for the treatment of arterial hypertension, diabetes, insomnia, heart palpitations, and tachycardia. Research shows that components of frankincense oil cause boswellic acids to have an anti-tumor effect on the following types of cancer cells, causing them to implode. Prostate cancer cells, colon cancer cells, cervical cancer cells, bladder cancer cells, leukemia cells, melanoma and fibrosarcoma cells, brain tumor cells. The FDA also went on to say the following. It is clear from the claims above that your Young Living Essential Oils products, Thieves, Cinnamon Bark, Oregano, Immu Power, Rosemary, Myrtle, Sandalwood, Eucalyptus Blue, Peppermint, Lang Lang, Frankincense, and Orange are drugs under Section 201G1B of the Act because they are articles intended for use in diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of a disease. And with this little letter, it was made clear to Young Living that they can't condone selling their oils as cures to diseases, which it was clear they were trying to do. And honestly, with Donald Gary Young as their leader, it's not surprising the company would lean towards the idea of making it okay to pretend you're a medical professional when you aren't. I mean, do we remember the multiple fake clinics he ran out that got shut down? But hey, the FDA complaint wasn't the only thing Young Living was doing that brought them under the government's scope. In late 2015, an article was published that stated a toxic tort slash environmental complaint was filed for a complex determination hearing in Oakland, California. Originally filed by the ERC or the Environmental Research Center on June 5th, 2015, they claimed that Young Living was in violation of California's Proposition 65. Prop 65 forces companies to announce when their ingredients contain higher than acceptable levels of certain chemicals known to lead to developmental toxicity. They had independently tested Young Living's oils and found levels to be in excess of acceptable lead levels and were demanding Young Living label the products in violation of Prop 65. When Young Living ignored the ERC's initial complaint with them, they filed with the California's courts, hence why this complaint surfaced publicly. Something to note here was that I had issues finding what happened in this court case. However, 
However, Young Living's website now has a section about Prop 65 and its labeling. So I guess something did happen there after all. I'll leave that one up to you to decide. Just 20 days after the first letter from the ERC was sent to Young Living, Donald Gary Young very suddenly stepped down as the CEO of Young Living Essential Oils and his wife, Mary, became the new CEO. Publicly, it was stated that he stepped down to pursue personal interests, but based on everything I've presented from part one and up to this point in part two, it becomes exceptionally clear that this was probably a decision by the board of directors of Young Living to try and preserve the brand. And at this time, Donald did not go back to the headquarters raging with an ax. So that's definitely an improvement. Although what a shame that the bar was set so low by himself for himself. In 2016, some of Young Living's own customer base began to question the quality of products received from Young Living. A blog page was posted where independent lab studies were published showing that once again, Young Living was not using pure unadulterated oils as they claimed they were. This time it was a curious seller who had submitted samples of cinnamon bark oil. This was the lab's results about the cinnamon bark oil. This sample has been adulterated with synthetic cinnamaldehyde, indicated by the presence of those isomers. Synthetic linalol may have also been added. When this person reported their findings to their upline, they were effectively ignored. But some other consultants got a hold of the information and submitted additional bottles of cinnamon bark and thieves oil for testing. Once again, the lab had determined that there were synthetic chemicals in the oils, therefore validating that Young Living was not using unadulterated oils as they claimed. This information was ignored by Young Living and there was nothing this person really did legally. So the information was just sitting online waiting for people to take a look at the results for themselves. In September, 2017, Young Living was once again in legal trouble with the government. The United States Department of Justice announced Young Living was going to be fined $760,000 and a guilty plea on federal misdemeanor charges for illegally trafficking rosewood oil and spikenard oils that violated the Lacey Act of 1900 and the Endangered Species Act of 1973. The company was additionally placed on a five-year probationary period for their missteps. Now, hearing this, you might wonder what this all means. Sure, it sounds intense and scary what they did, so let's break it down. The Lacey Act was established to prohibit trade of wildlife, fish, and plants that had been illegally possessed, transported, or sold. The act was originally put into place to preserve game and wild birds from going extinct and to help preserve native ecosystems. Now, the act serves more to prevent the importation or spread of potentially dangerous non-native species. So what was essentially happening was that Young Living was in possession of rosewood or spikenard oil that was sourced illegally one way or another. An important thing to note is that these findings were actually brought to the government by Young Living themselves. And unlike their founder, Donald Gary Young, this would be one of the first times Young Living admitted fault to something they did and tried to make amends for their actions. They also stopped selling products that contained those ingredients. And once again, Young Living seemed to slip off the radar and just do their thing. Now they were and still are an MLM. And there were many, many sellers that were joining into Young Living and losing money. But for the time being, all of these frustrations were quiet and unassuming, but there was trouble brewing and it bubbled over again in April of 2019. On April 12, 2019, a class action lawsuit was filed against Young Living stemming from Texas, accusing them of being a pyramid scheme. This was actually a lawsuit I covered on its own in one of my multi-level Monday videos. In this lawsuit, claims were made that Young Living operates an illegal pyramid scheme created under the guise of selling essential oils for quasi medicinal purposes. In truth, Young Living is nothing more than a cult-like organization falsely peddling the ever elusive promise of financial success and an alternative lifestyle. They claim that success with Young Living is just a pipe dream and that the company focuses on gaining more members versus selling more product and that Young Living's executive team was involved in thousands of overt acts of mail and wire fraud and presented over 20 examples of these cases. In the lawsuit's prayer for relief, the suit claims it wants damages for money lost by members, a permanent injunctive relief stopping Young Living from participating in being a pyramid scheme and the cost of litigation. This case is still ongoing. And just a couple months after that, on December 6, 2019, yet another lawsuit was filed against Young Living for being a pyramid scheme, but this time from the state of California. In this lawsuit filing, there were claims again of the company actively participating in a pyramid scheme while proposing dreams of financial freedom through peddling oils. This lawsuit additionally provided the following information that was quite interesting to read. Indeed, in 2016, the medium income of 94% of members was $0 a month 
and the average income was a dismal $1 per month. But these amounts do not include the hundreds of dollars in costs members incurred each year just to remain eligible to earn commissions. When these costs were accounted for, at least 97.5% of members lost money rather than earned money working for Young Living in 2016. In fact, in 2016, the average member lost $1,175. And members did not fare any better in 2018. Nearly 89% of members earned an average of $4 for the year. And again, this does not include the hundreds of dollars in costs incurred by members to achieve that dismal $4 annual income. Similar to 2016, at least 96.7% of members lost money in 2018 rather than earned money working for Young Living. The lawsuit also cited the ruling against Advocare, another MLM that was fined for being a pyramid scheme and was forced to leave the MLM sales model if they wanted to continue to be in business and drew similarities between the two companies, giving it more weight. They additionally cited the 7030 Amway rule, which is a ruling that independent sellers have to use to provide proof that at least 70% of all products they purchase are for retail sales and a maximum of 30% could only be for personal use. And this lawsuit claims Young Living encourages a gross and negligible violation of that ruling. In this lawsuit's prayer for relief, they demanded that the company is forced to stop being a pyramid scheme to possibly include the option of them not being able to sell as an MLM anymore and litigation fees. And here we are finally at the end of 2019. Even though we just went on this wild ride of Young Living's many, many mistakes, we still have not even scratched the surface of their income disclosure statements and how their sellers were losing hundreds and thousands of dollars. We didn't even get into the claims of Young Living being a cult and having a very scary and intimidating indoctrination into their so-called family. And to be clear about it, that might be something I touch on in the future. I really wanted this video to focus on the actions of the company and their missteps there, as I knew the script was already going to be insanely long and complicated. I did not want too many timelines crossing so I could try and make this as easy to follow as possible. Something I said in part one is how I believe the leadership shapes and influences a company. And if we're going to look at the company, we need to examine their leaders. In this case, Donald Gary Young. When we look at the lifespan of its founder and the company, I think it becomes super clear that Donald had a profound impression on Young Living and shaped the company for better or for worse. And this viewpoint will obviously change depending on your stance on the company. But looking at the overall picture, it does seem as though things have come full circle. The company was founded by a man built on the idea of scheming his supporters and spent most of his life pretending to be something he was not. And in recent years, his pride and joy, Young Living, is now beginning to crumble for scheming and deceiving its supporters. As much as I would love to go on, this is the current stopping point in the saga that is Young Living Essential Oils and its very eccentric founder, Donald Gary Young. This video was something that took me a long time to create and I hope you have enjoyed watching it. Please make sure to like this video if you haven't yet. And if you want to see more content like this in the future, feel free to hit that subscribe button too. A big thank you to everyone who supports me through channel memberships, which is YouTube's equivalent of Patreon, but especially to Gwendolyn, my top tier. Thank you so much for all the support all of you give me and allow me to keep making videos like these. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider hitting the join button below this video too. And again, guys, thank you so much for watching this video and taking a look at this mess of a company slowly becoming unwound and presented to you today. I love you all and I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.